All right, so we're going to talk about completing the square now. So at this point, if you've seen this in class or you've approached this at all, you're probably wondering what the heck is this good for? Why do I need to do this? Well, there's a couple reasons we use completing the square and it's actually a pretty useful tool, especially when it comes to visualizing quadratics and what they look like. So there is a method for solving quadratics that completing the square helps with, but for the most part, graphing quadratics and figuring out general form quadratics and what they look like is much simpler if we complete the square. And it allows us to convert something from general form into vertex form. So what was vertex form? Well, vertex form was something like this. y is equal to a, and then you had x minus p squared plus q. Some of you might have learned this is h and k, so like there's bunch of different ways but for the most part you've got some integer value here and you've got two integer values there these are the coordinates remember of your vertex and this was the stretch factor the vertical stretch factor on the graph so if you know those three things it's really easy to graph an equation so the problem is is if I had something like this plus 4x minus 7 well, I don't quite know what that looks like just by checking it out. I'd have to factor it, maybe find its roots, and then that might take me some time. I might not be able to factor it, so I'll have to use quadratic formula, and then I still don't quite know where the vertex is. So if I can find a way to get this to look like that, well, that's gonna make my life a whole lot easier because I can just stare at that and tell you a whole bunch of things about what the picture looks like. So here's what I want you to be aware of. Take a look at this. This is the whole point of completing the square. That is some binomial, remember p is just an integer, that's being squared. So I need to essentially create one of those inside of a trinomial. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So first of all, I'm going to take some random binomial and I'm going to expand it. So let's take some random binomial, let's say x, let's keep it simple, plus 3. Now, if I'm squaring that, that means I'm multiplying it by itself. So let's do that. So we're going to times that again by x plus 3. When I multiply these two things, I'm going to use my distributive property. x times x is x squared. x times positive 3 is positive 3x. 3 times x is positive 3x, and 3 times 3 is positive 9. So if I combine this, the trinomial I get is x squared plus 6x plus 9. So I want you to take a look at some of the patterns here. So when I squared x plus 3, I ended up with x squared plus 6x plus 9. So how can I get back from this to that? Well, do you understand that this here, well, that's just 3 squared. That comes from multiplying 3 by 3. And when I add 3 and 3, I get 6. So the way I can create a perfect square trinomial for anything is I just take the middle term and I cut it in half and square it. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine I had x squared plus 10x. Well, what term would have to go here in order to make this a perfect square trinomial? Well, half of 10 is 5, and again, because I'm splitting it into two even pieces that I'm then going to be multiplying out to get the last term. So half of 10 is 5, and 5 squared is 25. So that would make me a perfect square trinomial. When I factored that, it would factor down to x plus 5 times x plus 5. So we're going to use that little trick to kind of massage an equation into looking like this. Okay, let's discuss. So let's take one like this. Let's start with x squared, uh, let's keep it plus, plus 6x plus 11. So this most certainly is not in a form that I have a clear idea of what its picture is. So let's convert it into vertex form. So check it out. I'm going to take and start by ignoring this part. The reason I'm going to ignore that part is because that is by no means a perfect square trinomial. That's not going to get you a binomial multiplied by itself. It's not going to work. So I need to kind of create a, a perfect square trinomial out of these two things 
and then deal with the 11 later. So I'm going to say, well, x squared plus 6x plus something will make a perfect square trinomial. And then this minus, uh, plus 11 is just still going to be sitting around there afterwards. So what is the something that we have to add to this to make a perfect square trinomial here? Well, remember our method. We split this in half, right? Cut it in half. And we get 3. 3 squared is 9. So in order to make a perfect square trinomial here, I need to add 9. Well, this should hopefully raise some red flags because I just changed the equation. I just added 9 to an equation out of the blue. I can't do that. Right? I'm not allowed to algebraically. I've changed the value of what this thing is. So at the same time I add the 9, I also have to subtract a 9. Right? So do you see that right here, if I add and subtract 9, I'm essentially not changing the equation because I haven't done anything to it. I've added and taken away 9 immediately, so that's essentially a net zero effect on the equation. Now, you're saying to yourself probably, but you're making it different. As long as zero is being added to the equation, it's not different. It might look different, right? The actual equation itself might change in the way it looks, but the value of it won't, and that's the important part. So when I add and subtract 9, well, this 9 is useful for me for the trinomial. This 9, I can just fire over with the 11. So I can take my x squared plus 6x plus 9, and I can put that on this side. That's a perfect square trinomial. And then I've still got negative 9 plus 11 over here, right? When I factor this, well, that turns into x plus 3 times x plus 3. That's a perfect square trinomial. Well, I can then put together negative 9 and positive 11. Negative 9 plus 11 is positive 2. And now check it out. I end up with an equation that looks an awful lot like my vertex form. So this is x plus 3 squared plus 2. And now I can tell you what that parabola looks like, what that shape is. I know its vertex is at negative 3, positive 2. And I know that it's not being stretched or compressed at all. So I now know a whole lot more about what that picture looks like by converting it into this form. Okay? Now, next thing. What happens if there's a coefficient? What happens if something's in front of that x squared term? Because that's a problem, right? So let's say I have this one. Let's say I have 3x squared. Uh, what do I got? Uh, minus, let's say, 24x. Put a minus in there, make things a little trickier. And plus 9. So, problem now, right? That thing is causing me some stress. Because I'm trying to imagine some perfect square trinomial that gets me a 3x squared in the front. And I can't think of one. So I need to get rid of that. So if there's ever a coefficient sitting in front of that guy, it needs to leave. How do we make it leave? We factor it out. So once again, we're going to split this off from the mass because we don't need to worry about that till later. And we're going to try and create a perfect square trinomial here. But I need to deal with this first. I'm going to factor out that 3. right? Even if this is not perfectly factorable by 3, you still have to do it. You're going to end up with probably messy fractions. But if you're doing the completing the square method, you still have to factor out that term regardless of what it is. Fortunately for us, we're left with something that is factorable by 3. So negative 24 divided by 3 is negative 8. And there's an x left. Now, I know I'm going to be adding something here. So I'm just going to leave some space. And then that plus 9 is just going to sit over here. Okay, and we're going to deal with plus 9 later. We don't want to touch plus 9 for a while. So what do I have to do to make a perfect square trinomial here? Notice this 3, that looks like it's going to be our a value when all said and done. But let's keep going. So when I go to make a perfect square trinomial, I'm going to take half of this term. So half of 8 is negative 4. And I'm going to square it. So that's plus 16. But remember, I can't change the equation. I have to immediately minus 16. right? I have to have a net 0 effect on the equation. I can't change it. So that means plus 16 minus 16, that equals 0. All I have done is add 0 to the equation. So the value is still worth the same. Now, there's a problem. I hope you've spotted it. 
when I go to combine negative 16 with 9, I run into these brackets that I've already factored a 3 out of. So when I add 16 inside the brackets, remember I would still have to expand it back out. So by adding 16 inside the brackets, I'm actually multiplying that by 3. So if I'm going to take this 16 and combine it out here, I have to times it by the coefficient that's in front of the bracket. So I have to times it by 3. So what's 16 times 3? 48. So I'm going to minus 48 out here. Does that make sense? I hope. So when I take that term out of our bracket, because that's my perfect square trinomial, I don't want that there. When I take that negative 16 out, I'm going to subtract 48 from the outside. So let's do that. So there's our minus 48, and we're good to go. Notice this is now our perfect square trinomial. Super. What's that going to look like? My 3 is still going to stay outside. And this is going to be x minus 4 times x minus 4, or x minus 4 squared. And negative 48 plus 9, well, that's just negative 39, right? Now I know a whole bunch about this guy as well. I know that the stretch factor of it is 3, so it's going to be a far more compressed or stretched out version of a parabola. And I know that its vertex is going to be at 4 comma negative 39. So that tells me a whole lot of stuff about that equation, just by converting general form down into a form that allows us to see more about what the picture is. That's what completing the square is really, really good for, and it's why you should get a good handle on how to do it. Hope that helped. We'll talk.